The three destroyers formed up in a loose line abreast about 1945, all at four boiler split plant operation with running lights off. About 2030, we went to General Quarters, GQ Battle Stations, and started our run at 35,000 yards from the beach, building up speed. Soon we reached 32 knots, and at about 28,000 yards, started zigzagging. The zigzag legs were 3,000 yards long, all pre-planned. TU-7711 started taking counter-battery at about the same time, with the USS Cochran and USS McCaffrey taking the brunt of it. At about 24,000 yards, the radar picture cleared sufficiently for the Combat Information Center CIC team to get accurate fixes and to start the indirect fire control solution. Ranges came down quickly. The information flow was fast and furious, but pretty smooth. Virtually everyone was operating at optimum performance despite lack of sleep. The bridge forgot to pull in the after lookout, and he was tucked down under the aluminum deck shield for the Mark VI Fanfare torpedo decoy with Mount 53 going off right over his head and numerous enemy shells splashing close aboard or exploding in air bursts around him. He survived the battle, but I don't think his hearing was ever the same. About 20,000 yards from the beach, we took an air burst very close aboard to the starboard CIC watertight door and were all stunned. Close call. I immediately went back to work, plotting the mission and checking my data. A few minutes later, I heard about 15 explosions close aboard in the forward hemisphere of the ship. All of a sudden, my mind drew a blank. Then I heard Ensign Chuck Hall yell at me to get back to work. I know it was only two or three seconds lost, but those were the longest seconds of my life. It has never left my mind. At about 14,000 yards from the beach, we did the final check on the indirect fire control solution and found that we were right on our primary target. At 12,000 yards, we turned to our final approach zigzag leg before paralleling the beach and opened fire with Mount 51 at the primary target. After firing 15 to 20 rounds, Mount 51 had a material casualty. The captain and the weapons officer sent the great Master Chief Gunner's mate, Blaney, forward outside the skin of the ship where shrapnel was now flying all over the place to fix the gun mount. In a very short amount of time, Mount 51 resumed firing. But to us at CIC, after running seven miles under fire, it seemed like an eternity. We finished firing the primary target just as we were getting ready to do a high-speed turn to starboard to form a loose line of column. By the way, I don't think anybody had done greater than 30 knots divisional tactics in battle since World War II. We used about 15 to 20 degrees of rudder and healed quite a bit. As soon as we steadied, we checked the indirect fire control solution once more found that we were right on target and resumed fire, this time on our secondary target. Now we were under extremely heavy fire at point-blank ranges from enemy shore batteries 10,000 yards away. The bridge reported being smothered with shell splashes and often blinded by the bright orange air bursts of enemy able able Comet. Everyone topside could hear the whoosh of flying shrapnel. At this point, none of us realistically thought we would see the morning dawn, including me. After checking our fire control solution for the third pre-planned target, we started firing at about 9,800 yards from the beach. Shortly after firing, the fire control director slewed around the horizon, and we saw 40-plus enemy guns firing at us on the remote monitor for the FLIR in CIC. As I looked at all the enemy guns, I counted as many as I could and recalled 44 guns, probably 5 inch or larger. The recent intelligence, less than 48 hours old, was right on the money. About this time we took another pattern of shells close aboard, and I heard the electronic warfare specialist yell out, B-240Z J-Band. After a second pattern of shells landed close aboard, the executive officer, XO, fired off stack shaft dramatically from the remote controls of CIC. The enemy B-240Z trajectory adjusting radar locked onto the shaft cloud and the highly accurate counter battery fell off. If we had not been going 32 plus knots, we would have been hit for sure. The shaft cloud showed up on the SPS-10 radar screen with enemy counter battery shells impacting all around it. By this time, all ships had fired their tactical targets. All of a sudden, we thought we had sustained a direct hit. The ship shook violently. After checking all key control stations, we discovered we had not been hit, but it was the enormous blast overpressure shockwave of the B-52s hitting with some 900 tons of bombs. The 
they had dropped all at once. And as near as I can remember, we were about 12,000 yards from the drop area. The blast overpressure shook us like we were a kid's rattle being shaken violently. About this time, the surface strike commander ordered the high-speed retirement of the USS Cochrane and USS McCaffrey. We were ordered to stay behind with our vastly superior conventional firepower and cover their retirement. This was turning into a classic pitched World War II style surface gunnery battle for us. Over the next 10 to 12 minutes, probably longer, we engaged numerous counter battery sites, often shifting to direct fire to take advantage of the laser beam for instantaneous range of fire control solutions. We positively knocked out several enemy shore batteries to the north and to the west. We shifted back to indirect fire control and took out three or four more. I saw many secondary explosions at the enemy counter-battery sites from nearby ammo cooking up. Somewhere between the direct fire and the indirect fire, the ship did a high-speed 180-degree turn to parallel the beach going south. After we steadied up, I looked at the ship's speed indicator and we were doing 33 knots. Incredible. About this time, I heard the captain order the TJ the hell out of here. I had heard him shouting this over the 21MC and other key internal circuits. We did about a 90 degree high speed port turn to the east. Shortly after steadying up, counter battery became very accurate and heavy. Again, the electronic warfare specialist announced B240Z J band, and the TJ commenced violent evasive maneuvers to avoid counter battery. After another pattern of enemy shells landed very close aboard, the XO fired another slug of stack shaft, and again the enemy counter battery fell off as the B240Z radar acquired the shaft cloud erroneous target. During this time of our retirement, we were engaging enemy counter battery sites with our after gun mounts, Mount 52 and 53. Our return fire seemed uncharacteristically accurate for a destroyer retiring on violently evasive zigzag courses in excess of 30 knots. The throttle man nearly drags the motors and generators off the line while firing the after gun mounts and doing the evasive maneuvers. The customary whine of the engineering plan started to wane as the load was beginning to be lost. I distinctly heard the captain yell down over the 21MC to main control just two words, not now. Right after that, you could hear the whine of the turbines and generators come back to their customary pitch. Believe me when I say that if we had dropped the load that night, we surely would have been sunk by an enemy counter battery being directed by those damn B240Z radars. At about 28,000 yards from the beach, the heavy volume of enemy counter battery finally fell off us, and in another minute it was gone. At about 35,000 yards from the beach, we secured from GQ battle stations. I remember that Chuck Hall and I were so relieved to be alive that we shook hands vigorously with huge smiles on our faces. I did the same thing all over again with the others in CIC. I then lit up a well-deserved cigarette. To this day, it seems miraculous that we survived the amount of enemy counter-battery that was brought to bear on our ship. We all lived through this, worked as a well-trained and veteran combat team, and we all survived. By the grace of God, we were very lucky. This was the last fully engaged, totally pitched surface gunnery battle in U.S. Navy history. We had been outgunned five to one in sheer numbers of gun barrels. We had fought the entire action at speeds over 30 knots, had inflicted maximum damage on the enemy, and emerged nearly unscathed. The next morning I was out on the weather decks, looked up and saw part of the SPS-29 bed spring antenna shot away. However, the 29 radar performed great despite the damage to the radar and the waveguides from enemy shell fire. There was also a lot of shrapnel all over the weather decks. Every surviving crew member in those ships, especially the USS Turner Joy, remembers the Battle of Brandon Bay. It is forever etched in my memory.